All right. Uh, basically, I'm just going to let you talk. You know, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, but feel free to just say whatever you, you feel like. Don't worry about the time. And uh, I'll only ask things, you know, as they come to me. Um, all set? Okay. Uh, interview with Mr. Uh, James P. Lannan. Uh, interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Von Hasselm. Time is now uh, 0900 on December the 19th, 19th to year 2000. Before we get into World War II, Mr. Lannan, tell me a little bit about where you're from and, and how you grew up. Well, I was born in uh, Flatbush. I lived there till I was three years old, then we moved out to Queen St. Albans. And we moved around in St. Albans, and when I finally got went into the service, we had lived in uh, oh, near the old St. Albans golf course, where uh, Babe Ruth and all them guys used to go and play golf. And then I got inducted. Well, I went. I volunteered actually in '42, but. Uh, when they called me, I was uh, over 18 after they swore me in and went through the physical. They told me to go home and get drafted. So I had to go back home. I went to the draft board and requested that they draft me, and I went with the next group. So what uh, what year was that, 1942? Well, I went into 1943. 43. March 22, 1943. Now, what was your first assignment in the military? Boot camp. Where? Sampson. Sampson, New York. What was that like? Well, that was uh, okay, you know. First time away from home. The train ride was terrible. Chris, you get up there, everybody was full of soot. And you had black stuff coming out of your nose. And you looked a mess when you, when you got there. Was that your first trip upstate New York? Yeah. Well, what was Samson like in those days? It was a new post, wasn't it? Yeah, it was new. It was one of the nice places. It didn't have rats and cockroaches like the rest of the places. It was clean. We were first in the barracks that I was in. We were first group in there, and it was it was adequate. You know, it's cold up there, but not too bad. Well, what what was your typical training day like? Well, you get up. I think it was about five fifteen. Get up. You get ready. Clean up and shower and shave and get dressed. You make sure you make your bed and get outside in formation and march off to the to the uh, mess hall. And you'd have breakfast, you'd come back, walk back, and then you would start classes and all kinds of uh, training exercises. Target, provide, you know, language, uh, uh, how to protect yourself if you have to, if you go jump off the ship, uh, how to utilize your clothing as, uh, as, as a, like a life preserver, uh, rowboats, uh, everything that you were going to have to know. We learned about the uh, the blue, the blue Jackets manual, you know, they gave all the information on what was starboard, what was port, and bulkheads, and decks, and heads, and you know, all that terminology for the Navy. It must have been quite an experience for somebody coming from New York City. It was, it was, but it wasn't that bad, you know, I, I didn't, uh, <coughs> except when I, <coughs> our company was set to do mess cooking, which was KP. And I came down with the measles, so I didn't have to do that. I was in a hospital while they were in. But other than that, you know, the shots and all the other stuff, the grind and the marching. When did you first find out what you want to be doing in the Navy? When did I find out? Mm -hmm. Well, after I came back from leave from boot camp, we went to what they called an outgoing unit. And uh, while I was waiting for a further assignment, they, they decided that I was going to go to Gunners Mate School in Newport, Rhode Island. I didn't have any decision. They just told me where I was going, so that's where I went. And what was going to school like? Well, you know, the usual uh, training, and uh, that one had rats and cockroaches. We slept in hammocks there though, for 17 weeks, which was quite an experience. Uh, and why hammocks? Of course, that's what you had there. Hmm. They didn't have beds or bunks. Everybody had to sleep in a hammock. But you were in a building. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But they had a a jack stand bar up above that you would grab onto to pull yourself up into the hammock. The hammock was about maybe five feet off the ground. And everybody had one, you know, they were, except me, maybe the uh, first couple of days, you had a lot of people falling out of them and hear a little cursing and 
but we went down Newport Beach, went to all the, the ritzy places to go to the beach with target practice. And what kind of guns did you train on? Oh, mostly three inch fifties and five inch thirty eights, and then uh, forty millimeter, twenty millimeter. You had to shoot, uh, you know, the airplanes would go over with the targets, and you had to shoot them. But you go by all these mansions in Newport. It was really beautiful to go on the beach. And it was uh, a lot of limeys that they, they were doing the same thing as we were, mm -hmm. training. What about your off time, being in Newport? Uh... Well, I went into Newport a couple of times. That was uh, not a good place to go. Most of the time you would go to New Bedford or Fall River. The girls were much nicer there. If you liked Portuguese, you went to Fall River. If you liked French, you went to New Bedford. If you wanted to get in trouble, you stayed in Newport. And what type of trouble would you get into in Newport? All kinds. You name it. The, the gin mills there are all like buckets of blood. You get in. It wouldn't take long before there would be a fight going on or some damn thing. You had to learn how to, how to get out of the way quick. How long were you at uh, Gunner's Bait School? Uh, I think uh, 17 weeks. While we were there, they had <coughs> a big, big uh, parade and uh, thing for the Duke and Duchess of Windsor who were with uh, Captain Magruder. And I think they were all stoned, but uh, we were all over the guys were passing out from the heat and everything else, but we had to stand there until they got through reviewing us. That was really a momentous occasion. Well, what else do you remember about Gunners Main School? Did you uh, uh, meet a lot of different people from around the country? or? Oh, yeah, yeah. But don't ask me to remember who the hell they were. Yeah. I, don't, you know, I met so many people while I was in the Navy, I, I hardly remember any of them. And I'm sure that they don't. the same goes for them as, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. When did you first learn what your uh, next assignment was going to be? After I graduated from uh, Gunners Mate School. Mm -hmm. So, same thing, they told me to go to Little Creek uh, for amphibious training. And we went to Little Creek and went through all the same old jazz again and uh, was there until uh, December. We would practice on uh, landings and you know shooting and you know all, all of the, uh, the things that you would do in training. You know, learn what it was like to be on a ship. An LST. We took a, a, a shakedown on an LST, and then after that, I was assigned to LST 497 and told to go to uh, Indianapolis. So I went to Indianapolis and. We lived in a country club just outside of uh, Indianapolis and waiting for our ship to be ready. Uh, when our ship was ready, we went to Evansville, Indiana and picked up the ship, went down the Ohio River, down to Mississippi. It took about five or six days to mm -hmm. get, get down to New Orleans. And in New Orleans, we did all kinds of supplies. They commissioned the ship uh, uh, at the end of uh, 1943, December 1943. Yeah, with various repairs and modifications, and we went out to the Gulf of Mexico, Mobile, Alabama, and they they did a lot of alterations to our ship for so that we could handle wounded when uh, when the beach was set up an operating room and places to put uh, litters and and stuff like that, you know, to carry wounded back. And then we went around St. Andrews Bay in uh, Panama City, Florida practiced beaching and abandoning ship and, you know, all the usual stuff that you have to do. And in February, we went back to New Orleans and they loaded a, an LCT landing craft tank on our, on, a, on, our top, on our main deck that we were going to take over to Europe. And then we took off and went up to New York. <coughs> I got to New York. <coughs> they sent us to uh, Raritan and Arsenal to load up our tank deck with ammunition, you know, probably about 100 tons of 90-millimeter uh, ammunition that we were taking over as our cargo for, for that. Then we headed up to Boston. They wouldn't let us in the harbor, which I don't blame them. And then they, we went up to uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, to wait for the next convoy. Mm -hmm. And went across, took about 15 days to go across from Halifax to uh, Portishead, England, and it was a very rough trip. 
I imagine. It would be down here, and it, the ocean would be up there, and the next thing you're up there, and the ocean's down there. And it, with an LST, when you went along, you hit that, it would go. When it, when it hit, it wouldn't go like, you know, sharp like a, like a destroyer. It cut in. This thing would just bounce because it was made so that for the landings that uh, it had that flat bottom. And we finally got there and <coughs> took them about four or five days to unload the ammunition. Then we went and dumped off the uh, the L LCT in Bristol. And while I was in Liberty in, in Bristol, I'm walking down the street and I meet my uncle. I couldn't believe he was in the Army in the 4th Infantry. And they, he was training somewhere outside of Bristol. I couldn't believe him. We were walking down the street and here. He was the first and only person I ever met from home the whole time I was in. Hmm. But anyhow, we had a good time. And when uh, invasion came, he was in the 4th Infantry. He landed on Utah. And we, we landed on Omaha. So and we just went all around England, you know, practicing landings and uh, loading and unloading and, you know, the usual stuff. And then the end of, end of May, they canceled all liberty. Nobody could get off the ship. And uh, either, either around June, June 1st, we were loaded with uh, uh, members of the 29th uh, Division who were to land on uh, Omaha. They were, we had to follow up uh, Group. The 29th hit first, and then we were going to bring in the, the tanks and trucks. What more? Oh no, keep going. It. So, what was it like? You, you, were, you were secluded before the invasion. Uh, yeah, restricted on, to the ship. We were on the ship for mm -hmm. with with the soldiers and everything for about five days before we finally got over there. Mm -hmm. And that was. Uh, that was tough because uh, they had to be fed, they had to be taken care of. We were, we were anchored in Fowey, which was almost at the end of Land's End in, uh, in England, you know, which I, we were probably some of the furthest to go to, uh, to Normandy. Mm. What were your duties on the ship at the time? Well, I was a gunner's mate. Mm -hmm. I became a gunner's mate, and my, my duties were keep the guns repaired, clean them. Uh, I was a loader on the, on a 40 millimeter. Now you started out towards the invasion beaches at once and then had to turn around, come yeah. back? Yeah. What were you thinking at the time? I, don't, I wasn't thinking at all about anything. We knew we were going to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, they told us, and it, you know, it was nothing to think about. You, you go and you go. You, know, it, it, you couldn't get out of it, so I won't tell you. I was, I was just happy I wasn't in the Army. I didn't have to go on the land. That's why I joined the Navy. I figured I'm going to die. I'm going to die clean and full. What, what was it like actually running into the beach uh, that day? Well, we didn't run into the beach that day. Was, what happened is the weather got bad, and the beach was, there was a couple of ships hit mines, and they were, they were uh, plugged up the beach so you couldn't land. So what, what happened eventually, the first day we didn't do anything. The second day they come out with two LCTs that loaded all our stuff on the LCTs and they took it into the beach because they were smaller and they could get in there and, and get off easier than we could. So we would have like two days. Then we went, went back to, uh, well, we took a lot of casualties and some survivors on that we took back to England and loaded up again and came back. And then the next trip, we went to London and loaded up with, with British troops. And while we were going through the Straits of Dover, they were shelling us from uh, Calais with the big guns, the big berthas. Fortunately, they missed, but the escort ships were laying down a sm smoke screen so that they couldn't see us. But we were doing that on the beaches, too. Uh, everybody had, had smoke machines, and they were doing that so the airplanes couldn't see you, mm -hmm. hopefully. Fortunately, we were very fortunate that Germans didn't have an Air Force at that time. Otherwise, that could have really been a mess. It was probably one of the, well, guys that were in other invasions said it was probably one of the easiest ones that we had outside of southern France. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
And then what happened after, after the Normandy invasion, uh, what came next? Oh, we just shuttled troops and, and equipment back and forth. We'd made about 60 trips uh, from England to uh, the mainland, you know, went from Cherbourg, uh, La Harve, mm -hmm. uh, Rouen, Ostend, Belgium. In, in Belgium, we, we took mostly British and Canadian troops. And uh, in La Havre, we took uh, French and Algerian troops. They were the getting there to march into, to, uh, for Paris. Be more specific. Well, uh, where were you uh, when the war in Europe ended? In Europe? Mm -hmm. we still just shuttling back and forth? Yeah, yeah. Well, they still had to be supplied. And uh, then after, after Germany surrendered, we went up to uh, Hamburg, Germany, and picked up uh, British troops and equipment and took them up to Oslo, Norway, mm. where the Germans were still walking around with their guns and everything else. This year was in June, and the beautiful thing about that, that if you, you went up them fjords, you felt like a Viking coming home. It was, uh, it never got dark while we were there. You know, it was land at a midnight sun, mm -hmm. and that was interesting. But we had a Polish guy on a ship who could speak Polish and, and English, and met a Polish uh, worker that the Germans had brought over who could speak Norwegian and, and, and Polish. So we had two guys working to get the girls. How did it work? Worked good. <laughs> Worked very good. First one up there, they were selling uh, cartons of cigarettes, and they were getting 80, 100 bucks for, for a carton of cigarettes. And that was a, during, during, you know, in England, they were worth 20 bucks, they were, you know, wherever you went. They were, and they cost us 60 cents. For a carton? Yeah, and you, you, you were assured of a good, a good bottle of Johnny Walker Scotch for, for a carton of cigarettes, because you, the pubs, you know, they open and time trays, they, they would close, and then you had to go out, and they would open up a couple hours later, and be open for two or three hours, and they would close again. They didn't, they didn't stay open all night. I mean, some of them you could sneak around the back door, and they would, they would let you in, you know, as long as you weren't too noisy. How was it living in England during the war? Well, England was nice. The English people were very nice. Uh, it, they didn't have a hell of a lot. It was, uh, although we did, used to have a lot of trouble with the English servicemen and the American servicemen. We didn't, we didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things, but other than that, it was, uh, it was quite good. And what kind of things would you have disagreements with the English servicemen about? About who's better, who's not, you know. The, the famous saying over there was uh, that we were overpaid, oversexed, and over here. And that was, that was the attitude. We couldn't blame them, you know. We were taking their girls. Well, they, they were all over the damn place, you know. They, they were, I could understand their, uh, their position. Did, did, any, uh, did anyone ever tell you that, that you were over, overpaid and over uh, sexed? Personally? And, yeah. I don't think so, but I heard it many times. I'm sure everybody over there. Did you have any particular comeback to that, or uh, did you have a reply to the English? For, you know, Not for that I recall. <laughs> Usually wound up in a fight. And uh, what about the uh, English food or the climate? Anything remarkable? Well, the climate was, you know, it was damp. Uh, not really any great summer. You didn't do a lot of swimming there or beach, you know. The, uh, the food was, was not, a, you know, everything was pretty much rationed. Their food itself, maybe you get some fish and chips, but uh, like their sausages were more uh, cellulose than they were meat, you know, was, uh, with flavoring. And, and just to get eggs, everything that went, you know, that was anything decent came to the servicemen. The poor people that lived, lived there didn't get it, you know. Sounds like you had a better time in Norway than you did in England. Well, no, England was good. I had a lot of fun in England. Went London, uh, we had, uh, had some good times. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't bad times.
you know, had a five-day leave up in London, and we hadn't seen all of the stuff, Piccadilly Circus, Trafalgar Square. We knew where, where all, the, all the girls hung out. It was very easy to get a room. Spent a couple of nights in air raid shelters. Yeah. During air raid attacks? Oh, yeah. yeah. Buzz bombs, primarily. And they would, they would be coming over. And as soon as you heard them stop, then you run like hell. Because they knew they were coming down. As long as you heard the motor, they were still going. But if it stopped, that means it's coming down. We had a couple of ships that, that got it uh, in London shipyards, you know, killed uh, quite a few people. So what happened after Norway? Well, not that we came back uh, to England and got ready, prepared to come home. We were the last convoy of LSTs out of, out of England. We loaded up with uh, another LST to bring back. And uh, they filled us up with uh, 88 millimeter ammunition to, to carry back. The same amount of 90 uh, as we had of 90 millimeter bringing over. And we had Dutch Marines that came over for training and uh, other Air Force and Naval personnel as passengers. And again, it took us another 12, 12 to 15 days to uh, arrive back. In, uh, in the States. But they all came into New York and they sent us over to Raritan Arsenal to unload. So we missed out on the celebration there. So we unloaded, headed down to, I went home on Liberty. And then went back to the ship, we went to Norfolk. And after we got to Norfolk, we got 30 day leave. And I went home and I was home uh, VJ Day, which meant that we weren't going to go to the Pacific because they were setting us up to go to the Pacific. Uh, that was that was a lovely day. We had a lot of fun that day. What would happen then? VJ Day? Yeah. Big celebration. Everybody was happy. The friggin' war was over. You know. Did you uh, did you go into Manhattan or were you in Brooklyn on VJ? Oh no, I lived in Queens. We was out in Queens. You know, and Manhattan was for visitors. They didn't go there. Very rarely went to Manhattan. So what was the VJ celebration like in Queens? Same as it was every place else. There was lots to drink, lots of girls. It was, uh, it was just everybody was happy. It was, uh, it's hard to explain, but uh, it was uh, quite good. Must have been quite a sight. Where in Queens were you at the time? Well, I lived in St. Albans. Mm -hmm. That's where I lived, you know. So I was home. And I, I think when I was home, my brother, he also came home. And he had, he was in the Pacific. And my uncles and stuff. And my, my brother was in, he was in the Navy. My younger brother got in towards the end of the war, went in the Army. Mm -hmm. And I had uh, three uncles that were in the, in the Army. We had uh, everybody was happy, you know. Every, everybody in the neighborhood had somebody there, and you know the hope was that no more killing, and everybody was happy. So, did you have an idea of what you wanted to do after the war at that point? No, I still don't know what the hell I want to. <laughs> what did you end up doing after the war? Uh, I did various jobs, and <clears throat> and I got married. Had a couple of kids and I went in the police department. And uh, I was in the police department for 13 years. And I hated every minute of it. I didn't like being a cop. Both my brothers are cops and they loved it. They would have been cops for free. Mm. But uh, to me, it was like shoveling shit against the tide. You'd lock somebody up, and the next thing you know, he's out and you're in. It was just a waste of time, all politics. And I just got disgusted with it and quit. Moved upstate. I've been happy ever since. 1965, moved up here. I wish I'd have moved up here sooner. Looking back on it all now, uh, anything else you remember about your participation in the war, how you felt about it at the time? Well, there were times you were scared to death. You know, we had ships that 
where we, our crew's quarters was, we slept right over the screws. And they had these vibration mines that if you went over a vibration mine, the screws and up it come and wipe out the crew's quarters. So that was kind of frightening. And then during the storm that they had, where everything got blown all apart, we had some German planes come over and drop bombs. And we could see the bombs hit and explode. And fortunately, none of them hit us. And we had to keep both the engines going. We had both anchors down, down so we could stay in a position we were in because the storm was lasted for four or five days and it wrecked everything on the beaches. And then we had, uh, we took back prisoners, a lot of casualties, German prisoners. In fact, we had the German prisoners that got an orange egg, got a, got a watch off a German for, for an orange, which was a pretty good deal because I didn't have a watch. My first wristwatch, and uh, they would pick them up in Cherbourg and took them over to Southampton. He probably went back to the States and lived a, lived a good life. <laughs> Any other times you particularly remember being scared? No, I didn't. Really, the only time I was really scared was when uh, we were at general quarters and they were over. It was strange because and this guy that was supposed to be contacting the, the bridge, he couldn't talk. He was so scared. <laughs> and the guy that was supposed to hand me the ammunition, I couldn't find him. And where the hell he went? What about some of the more pleasant memories? I mean, you look back and think of anything that uh, was a particular fondness, more memorable moments, uh, people you met, characters. Now, one of the, when we first went over there, we uh, had to go up the Bristol Channel. We had to go through a lock. And uh, in order to open and close the locks, they had these two donkeys walking around the circular, open up. I thought that was funny. And a couple of girlfriends there. But then everybody had a couple of girlfriends in there. In Bristol? Uh, one in Bristol. And, uh, we had a lot of fun in, Tor in, in Southampton. I don't recall meeting anybody uh, for any, you know, it's pretty much. Well, what would you do on a typical date, you know, when you, when you went out with an English girl? Well, you'd go dancing and try to get laid. <laughs> what else would you do? It, it beat Mary Jane and the Five Sisters. You're going to cut that? No, we're going to leave that in. <laughs> in fact, I think I'm going to highlight it. <laughs> Just tell them my wife said. Well, we wanted honesty. Um, anything else you'd like to add, you know, looking back on it now? My naval career or just... Uh, in general. Well, I loved it. I loved the Navy. I really, really did. Uh, I, I had signed up for six years. And uh, I was going to make it a career. And then they, after I come back, I got reassigned to another ship. And we went down through the Panama Canal and up to San Diego. And uh, I was getting fed up with it and I was a little homesick. So I got the opportunity to get out and I got out. So uh, the ship went to China and I went to New York. And I was never, you know, never sorry about it. I, we were going to, my brother and I were going to join the reserves, but we had to go into Manhattan to do it. So I said, oh, well, we're not going to go to Manhattan. No. Fortunately, we didn't because the Korea War came up. <laughs> if we'd have been in the reserves, we'd have been gone. Right. And anyway, we were both married at that time, had kids. So. What was it you liked so much about the Navy? I don't know. I just love being out at sea. The, the, you know, it, it's hard to explain. The sun rises, the sun sets, the storms, uh, the, the majesty of the whole thing. It, uh, I, did, I just loved it, you know. Of course, I was a kid and 
never having been out of uh, New York in my life, everything was, uh, but it was, uh, I think you did a pretty good job of explaining it. Anything else you'd like to add? No, I don't think so. <laughs>